This week on the Backtable Podcast. Something that's been important for me in this process is really hearing examples of this demonstration of resiliency and grit. Surgery is very difficult. And thinking back, I don't know if I didn't have things that helped me develop grit and resiliency before training. I, I wouldn't have made it through residency, and I certainly would have made it through the first five years of practice after training. And so I love to hear stories. And there's so many different stories, whether it's you know a personal tragedy or someone that's an athlete who is in the performing arts, just kind of individual stories about how candidates can kind of demonstrate that they have the ability to navigate through and thrive in circumstances that are very, very challenging and, and very demanding on us. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Backtable Podcast, your source for all things urology. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and at backtable.com. This is Aditya Bagrod as your host this week, and I'm very excited to introduce our guest today. We have Steve Hudak from UT Southwestern Department of Urology and Teresa Olmsted from University of California, San Diego Urology Department. Steve, Teresa, how are you all doing today? I'm doing fantastic. Thanks for having me. Doing great. Thanks for uh, having us. It's great to be back. Well, I'm I'm thrilled to have uh, both Teresa and Steve on, on the show today. Uh, Steve is is a good close friend and mentor that I've had the good chance of overlapping with as a trainee and as a partner for several years. And Teresa is one of our brand new interns here at UC San Diego. And I was kind of thinking, you know, there's been so much that's evolved since the last time we did a uh, episode on kind of getting into urology residency with pandemic and virtuals that it might be a good chance to kind of reconnect and get an updated lay of the land. So we might just, if, if it's okay, start out with introductions. Um, Steve, do you want to kick off a bit? Yeah, sure. So again, thanks for uh, having me back. Uh, really a privilege to be part of this podcast that uh, really been very formative to many of our trainees and and faculty alike. Uh, over uh, kind of day after day, you hear more people citing your episodes and 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 your content. So kudos to y'all. As far as me, I'm a residency program director at, at UT Southwestern. I'm a reconstructive urologist uh, by training, um, and uh, I'm really excited to kind of share in this uh, the changes because that's really been kind of the name of the game over the last you know four years. Has been a little bit different each year, so it's exciting to be back with you. Uh, to share an update today. Awesome. Awesome, Steve. Teresa, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Yes. So I am coming from Washington, Seattle, Washington, where I did both undergrad and medical school there. And now I am a recent transplant to San Diego, first year intern and super excited to join the team. Start on, um, you know, general surgery, but I'm eagerly awaiting my time uh, and with the urology department. All right. Perfect. Perfect. So a lot of what we're going to talk about is nearly certainly going to be fresh in your head. And I was taking a walk down memory lane. I'm not old, but I'm not young. And I kind of remember you you explore, you're on your rotations, and then somehow you hear about urology. I was a third year when, um, you know, I'd done peds and I'd done family. And and then somebody was like, I think urology might be a good fit. And I explored it a bit. And um talked to our program director and it was kind of like, all right, Aditya, what are your board scores? X. Okay. I think you've got a shot. Here's what we need to do to get you into a decent residency. Your grades have to be good. Your board scores have to be good. Work hard on your rotations and, you know, try to get some research going. And that seemed like a, a pretty reasonable formula once upon a time, but I'm not totally sure that's applicable anymore. And maybe... Therese, we can start out with, you know, how does this kind of start happening that the exploration of urology as a as a possible career choice for you? Yeah. You know, it was hard, at least for my medical school. We did not really have any exposure to surgical subspecialties. So even in our general surgery rotation, I spent, you know, the six weeks or, or whatnot mostly doing true general surgery. Um, and so I kind of had to seek out opportunities for myself. And unfortunately, I had my gen surge rotation very last. So I had to be a little bit more proactive in terms of knowing kind of what I wanted in a specialty and and then uh, kind of finding my way in terms of, of how, I, how I could go about getting exposure. 
And so I was late to the game for sure, um, which was intimidating uh, to say the least, just because as we all know, urology is quite competitive. So I think that it was at the end of my third year when I was kind of deciding between ENT and urology, and I took an elective in both of those. And um, ultimately, you know, I, I chose urology. And from that point forward, I was able to kind of hone my focus into preparing for a ways and sub eyes and um, making myself kind of the most competitive applicant as, you know, as I could. But I think that, yeah, it, it, especially being a late comer to the field, it was intimidating and not necessarily having the research that I knew a lot of the people who I was going, you know, up against per se, I didn't have the degree of research that they did. Yeah, that's, um, I think it can be scary. And Blake, who who came on the podcast a couple of years ago to talk about his experience, shared a very similar trajectory where he was thinking more about infectious disease or health health mm-hmm. policy and was kind of a late comer to urology. And I got to say, I mean, people reach out to me, hey, I'm a sophomore in high school. What do you think about me? I'm not kidding. You know, can I join your lab? Because I, I think urology might be a good fit for you. I was like, oh my gosh, you're, you know, <laughs> forget undergrad or something beyond that. Now, Steve, for you, so you're probably getting the full gamut, right? You've got first year medical students, third year late comers, and they say, well, what should they do? Should they come to you? Should they, how, how should they get exposed? And when they're deciding that this might be a, a fit, how does that conversation go? Yeah. So I think there's, you know, two kind of general categories here. There's the medical student that is uh, at a medical school where there is a urology residency program. And there's the medical student uh, who is not afforded that opportunity. And clearly there's the benefit of having those resources nearby. And so usually in those cases, it happens much more organically. Uh, most uh, medical schools that have home programs will have a urology interest group. They'll have a dedicated faculty member as the point of contact. And so for those medical students, it's really, really easy to kind of dip your foot in the water to get, you know, usually you'll have, you know, someone will buy free pizza and, and um, you know, a group of first, second, and third years will sit down and listen to some faculty and some residents just because it's there. And it's, 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 it's very, uh, you know, within reach. And then you'll have contacts, establish mentors, and really kind of start the process of seeing if, if, if this is, this is for you. Those that are at programs where there's not a urology residency program, it's certainly a different, a different ball game because none of those kind of happen automatically. And so taking that first step can be very difficult. I think the sub I process is, is, is very helpful, but you know, many folks, uh, like, like Teresa was saying is you'll be a little bit behind the game if you wait till that point. And so then it takes extra motivation by the student to make either connections with local urologists or to reach out to other programs. Um, social media, I think is helpful here too, for people to see kind of programs that are front facing via direct message and to make some of those connections. So without a doubt, those students are at a disadvantage, but I think that. Uh, those of us that are clearly at the medical schools where, where students have those advantages, oftentimes will see those opportunities uh, to mentor. We see this in the Dallas-Fort Worth area with there being a medical school that's recently started up at, at, at TCU. So we have some geographic proximity without program proximity, so to speak. And so I think the reason I mentioned that is that I would say that probably most program directors and, and faculty that are interested in GME are excited to hear from interested medical students from other places and willing to provide some of that initial mentorship that happens organically when you have it locally. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And, um, you know, I feel really fortunate to be at a program that's prioritized trying to help folks from various backgrounds get into urology. We've got six or eight funded positions for people without a home program or underrepresented minorities. I think UT Southwestern also has such a program, Michigan, UCSF, and it's it's really nice to see. Yeah, definitely a more of an uphill battle, but um, I think more attainable now than than once upon a time. So, Teresa, maybe walk down memory lane. So you you rotated on ENT, you'd rotated on urology. You're maybe talking to any number of the amazing faculty at UW, and you know th- this is it, Doctor Gore, Doctor Lynn, Doctor Sutherland you know, I think I want to be a urologist. What do I do to really make this happen? Yeah, I think that that was the most intimidating part was like making a decision and then and then figuring out how I can how I can achieve this goal. 
And, you know, for me, it was really too late in the game to, to do research. So I very much focused on kind of my clinical strengths. And so applying to, you know, and, and I will say doing the two-week elective, and I know a lot of people don't have this opportunity, but I think doing this two-week elective kind of allowed me to dip my toes in the water and low stakes, pass, fail, two-week elective in which I could become familiar with the specialty. I mean, this was truly my first exposure to the specialty at all. So not only, you know, get exposure to the specialty, but kind of how, the, you know, the day-to-day and how to be helpful. And so I think it was a low stakes setting in which I kind of was able to get a baseline in terms of how I could take that and then succeed in my home sabai and then my away rotations. And so I think that in terms of, you know, there's a whole number of things, preparation that goes into performing well on a sub I. Um, and I'm happy to go into detail about that. But, you know, I think it really boils down to just, you know, they're going to be tough. And so you have to realize that and you have to prepare yourself. And I think it's different from, in my head, I saw it two different ways. I'm like, okay, you have to impress the residents and then you have to impress the faculty or the attendings. And in that, like, I think that they're looking for two very different things. And so getting along with the residents and showing them that you're a hard worker and you're a team player, like that is the big thing that they care about. They don't necessarily see you or pimp you in the OR like the attendings do. So I think that when it comes to you sitting a lot, you know, shining, I'll say, in, in a clinical setting for the residents, it's it's really like, you know, are do you have situational awareness in terms of like uh, reading the room and understanding when they are super stressed and don't have time to answer the little questions that really aren't urgent? You know, do you are you proactive in uh, rounding and getting supplies and, you know, taking out drains later in the evening? And so I think that that like shows initiative and shows hard work. And are you just like a likable person? Whereas in the OR, you know, there's a lot of things that you prep for each case. And for me, I would look, I would look up the patient. I would have a really solid understanding of like what brought them to the OR that day. But if it was bladder cancer, I would go and I would do a little bit of research about, you know, muscle invasive bladder cancer, the staging. I would look up the anatomy, obviously. And then I would look at the imaging. And so I think that, you know, it's, it's just so different. Like I, I very much felt like there was two schools of people in which I had to, you know, it was just very different in terms of how you do well or how you perform well for, for either group. Yeah, I appreciate that. And, and even it's uh, when you mentioned look up the anatomy, obviously, I think you'd be shocked at how not obvious that is to so many people, um, not just as medical students, but across the spectrum. And, you know, this uh, dichotomy between being helpful without being intrusive or obtrusive, it, I mean, our whole medical system's got to change because it's so bonkers. It's like your little appendage where you're not really given any responsibility, but you're supposed to like figure out how to be helpful. That's always sure. kind of challenging. And I mean, for me, I feel like I was always on pins and needles on any rotation. Like, am I going to like upset somebody or say the wrong thing? And like my career is like over. I think those were all excellent, excellent points. And, you know, maybe Steve, I can ask you, student interested in urology, hey, Dr. Hudak, can we meet and just talk about what I can do to start making me, you know, an ideal candidate? What does that conversation look like? And maybe we could, we could divvy it up in early stage, like first year, second year, and then more like serious, this is happening third year, fourth year. Yeah, definitely. I think, I think early on it's, it's critical that they just really look into all the fields they might, they think they're interested in and, you know, be very honest with themselves, uh, with regards to their, to their technical abilities, their kind of interest in, you know, longer or shorter duration programs. I think it's important for mentors to be transparent about what it means to be a surgeon and what that does, uh, either good or bad, depending on your perspective to your life outside of the hospital. So I think it's important to be honest and transparent to kind of give them information to see if it's for them. Uh, you mentioned your story about board scores, Aditya, and, and I can relate to that as well. And I think the the fact of the matter is, is that many of these metrics that we have after the first couple of years are, 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 are gone. And there's a lot of good aspects of that. I think one good aspect of that is it's no longer a situation where we're directing people toward or away to a specialty based on their board scores or their grades. And I think this is a good thing because then we can really allow people to kind of grow where they're planted and do what they truly want. I'm not saying it's easy to identify what you truly want, but once once you do, it's nice not to have those barriers. 
so early on, I think it's it's a it's it's an interesting interesting process to get started, and it's very very different. You mentioned uh, you know your board scores that were you, you were asked about your board scores when you were first addressed some uh, interest in urology, and obviously that doesn't exist anymore. That that possibility isn't there, and I think that there are a lot of good uh, things that can come from this. Once upon a time, if someone came into a, a urologist's a faculty urologist office and they had really low board scores, they might be turned away and said, this is not for you. You won't be able to match. And so I think it's really fortunate that now that this kind of screening process is no longer possible. And then therefore it allows us to really allow the, the medical student to determine if this is what they really want to do. And then in that process, I think it's important for us as faculty to really share everything there is to know about being a urology resident and then being a urologist, for us to be transparent about what it means to be a surgeon the highs and the lows, both in the hospital and in our time outside of the hospital, and how this is different from non-surgical subspecialties. And so, with the you know the majority of meds- medical schools going to pass fail and the removal of of step one scores, it really I think it becomes a little bit more candidate focused to help people decide is this for them. And so we eliminate that possibility to screen, and then with us sharing what it is then allowing them to develop things that will allow them to be unique and stand out from other candidates, making connections for research for those who get a head start on it. And so I think that that's kind of, it some ways simplifies the first two years because it's no longer a, a checkbox you're in or you're out. It really allows people to really see if it's a good fit for them. I think as a program, it's important for us to have opportunities for first and second year medical students, whether it's through the interest groups we discussed, mentorship response or possibilities, it's great now that many medical schools are getting students into the clinical realm during the second half of their second year. And so having opportunities for uh, them to see urology early on, I think is very, very important. And when they're developing interest, they're also going to develop connections. And those connections are going to lead to exposure and opportunities that allow them to kind of broaden their portfolio and get ready for the application phase. Yeah, that's that's really insightful. And I, I like the way you kind of talk about first and second years. And always, it's always a bit of a struggle, right? It's it's like you really need to explore what's out there. There's different approaches to fields, which ultimately wind up in some degree of specialization, you know, broad exposure, interest, and a bunch of different stuff to me. Seems like there's a lot of value in that. And then there's, you know, the kind of conundrum of being a bit more focused early on to optimize yourself. And I, I think I've heard it from everybody and and I believe it that you know if you're a latecomer that's certainly not a bad thing. Some of the things that I I would say from my perspective is I always tell people first and second year settle in, make sure your courses and all that kind of stuff's good before you start committing to research. I do think it's good and better that that students are a bit more discriminating on the type of research and the number of projects that they're getting involved with. And I, I tell people now, I'm like, you know, this is your life and it's your time and we don't want to waste your time doing something that's not uh, meaningful to you. It's not going to move the needle forward. And sometimes those kind of quick wins that lead to abstracts and maybe lower quality publications are a bit of a waste of time. They fluff out the already like over fluffed literature. And, and then again, there's always that balance too, right? It's like, I don't want you to write a clinical trial that's going to activate in five years. That doesn't really do you a, a, a whole lot of good other than saying this guy's amazing or this girl's amazing or this person's amazing. So I, I hear you loud and clear, but I would just say for the early phases, try to find somebody who resonates with you. And um, if you commit to something, try to see it through. I agree. Simple, yeah, one-on-one. I, yeah, I agree. And I think... What res- resonates with me about that, I think, is timeless. I mean, there have been a lot of changes we've discussed, but if I reflect back down my memory lane, which is now over two decades ago, I think one thing which probably still reigns true is what really got me interested in urology was kind of the way I felt when I was with the residents and with the urologists. Um, and I can't imagine that will ever change. And so having opportunities either, you know, formally via a sub-I or informally via, you know, a... Um, elective rotation, I think really seeing if this is your village, I think is, I think is critical. And I don't think that will change no matter what uh, the application process uh, uh, does to us with its different evolutions. Totally. And I'll just add something to that of like, you know, I mentor a lot of third and second and third years, I would say, um, medical students who are interested in urology. And my biggest piece of advice for them is like, 
during your first two years, shadow. Like shadow as many specialties as you can because during third year, you really don't have that much time to take electives. Like I had to take the, the we have one period off. I had to take that period off to, to go do these electives. And so I cut my kind of break time short. And in hindsight, my biggest regret is not taking the first two years before even deciding what research to do to go explore the specialties first and then decide, okay, I'm interested in this. And then you can pursue research uh, if that's, if that's what you would like to do. But yeah, I think that, I think shadowing is, is so hugely important and something I should have taken advantage of um, my first two years, which I didn't. Definitely appreciate that. And, you know, again, if I, if I kind of go back to the algorithm that was presented to me, so board scores, they're out. I would posit that's a good thing. It did take me a little bit of a evolution to come to this conclusion. Grades, I mean, I look at the grades, they're uninterpretable to me. You know, somebody's on high pass, low pass, medium pass, somebody's honor, somebody's yeah. pass fail. So that I'm not sure what to do with. The dean's letter, again, a fairly generic piece of information from likely somebody who doesn't know the person. Then we have letters of rec. And many times these are moving towards more standardized synoptic type of reports which maybe we can talk a little bit about pros and cons of that. And then research. And honestly, you know, I've kind of shared, I, I do research. I'm, I think I'm kind of known for being a research heavy person. But even as I reflect on this, I'm like, you know, there's a lot of ways that you can benefit the field. And maybe that's advocacy. Maybe that's patient education. Maybe that's the God knows what, but it should resonate with you. And it should be meaningful to our patients and to our field. So I'm not even sure that that's really like a, you know, a unifying thing. If you're not like a research person and don't want to do it, and at the end of the day, right, like 90% of people graduating are not going into academic jobs and continuing research. So, you know, in the 21st century, what are you going to do? Let's talk about a ways, let's talk about an application to really make yourself stand out and also to make sure you find a best fit in terms of a residency. And, and Teresa, maybe we can start out with you. You know, you're, if I understand it correctly, even to do a ways now, it's not so much of a apply and wait. There's a bit of a process. Can can you educate me? Yeah. So I remember, I think it was in my last rotation of, of my third year when I was also simultaneously having to write a personal statement, which I was very unprepared for, and get letters of recommendation um, because a lot of the away programs require that. And doing all of this while also trying to, um, you know, maintain good clinical standing with my last rotation and, and study for the shell. And so I think that that was stressful knowing that I had to kind of balance all of this. And I was really in, in the dark in terms of, you know, how competitive of an applicant I was or was not and how many programs or away programs I should apply to. And so I leaned on, you know, my home program mentors, uh, which I was fortunate enough to have to kind of uh, lead me in them. And so when I was applying to my OA rotations, I think that, you know, University of Washington had had given us this little uh, presentation about how, you know, statistically you have the best chance of matching either at your home program or, or one of the programs that you do in OA. And so in that, you want to make sure that you are really tactful in terms of what where you do choose to do an away rotation. And so I think that for me, I did aways at places that I knew I would be happy to be at if if that is where I ended up matching. And, you know, but even then in terms of where you apply to aways, like I had I had no idea. You know, there's Doximity, there's US health news reports, but we all know those, you know, that that's not the best indicator. And so again, I very much relied on my home program mentors and I would bring them, you know, here are the places that I got accepted into away rotations. Help me help me figure out, you know, where I should go. And I think that the geographic regionality is a big thing as well. I had spent my entire life in Washington. And so, you know, you want to broaden your um, your scope in terms of doing a wave outside of where you were born and raised. And, you know, some people say that doesn't matter, but I can guarantee you in almost every interview I was asked, you know, you've been in Washington your whole life. Like, would you ever leave? And that is why, you know, I, I've done a ways and I, I was open to go anywhere. But I think that, you know, those are some things that you have to think about. So, yeah, in a way, it's, it's, it's important that you go somewhere that you would be happy to match. It's important that you broaden your scope in terms of geographically where, where you've spent the most time. 
And um, ultimately, like I very much relied on the expertise of people who knew the field far better than I did or far better than Doximity or U.S. Health News did to kind of lead me in terms of in terms of best fit really for me. Perfect. Perfect. And Steve, you know, I'm, I'm a fourth year or a third year applying and thinking about a ways, maybe just some like softballs, maximum number of ways, minimum, minimum number of ways. You know, I think once upon a time I was told pick a program that's a reach, pick something that's like, you know, a solid matchable option, then pick a place that'll get you to being a urologist, you know, so long as nothing kind of screwy happens. Can you comment on that a little bit? Yeah, I think the game has probably changed on that because I think it was easier to declare, to you know, kind of declare programs as a reach or a, a you know, a solid, you know, whatever classification you want to use when you were able to line yourself up and compare yourself to other candidates based on, you know, historical norms with regards to grades, AOA and scores. And so with all of those or the majority of those being gone and AOA, AOA kind of losing some of its footing with many schools opting out those kind of ways that you would say what a reach is, is, is in many, in many cases, not as valid as it once was, which again, there's some positives to that. I think from, uh, you know, uh, an advice standpoint, I would definitely echo uh, what Teresa said was choose programs that, you know, are in areas that you would want to live for five years, choose programs that for the information you have them about them, you think would fit what you're looking for in a program. Because if you're going to that program, and you, it's a good fit for you and you knock everybody's socks off, the likelihood of you matching there is very, very strong, regardless of if it was historically considered, you know, kind of a stretch for your application or not. Um, so I would think, uh, you know, again, not trying to game the system, but really trying to say where are places that I think I would like to be and then, uh, uh, you know, kind of start there. Yeah, I like that. So these days, for and away, is there an application? Is there a token? Is there a or is it just you apply and how does it work? I mean, practically, and forgive my ignorance on this. No, I, no not at all. I'm and, not intimately involved. And the SAU, um, you know, piloted a program last year's where they tried to have a standardized release date to prevent people from kind of hoarding offers. Um, I think that there was kind of of kind of variable uh, penetrance of that, and as a result, it didn't it didn't it didn't rehash itself this year. So this year. It was kind of like you you apply and and then you select the ones or, you know for that you that you get accepted to. So it worked a little bit worked a little bit a little bit differently. As far as numbers, that's usually going to be number of rotations. That's usually going to be limited by the medical school and also by the calendar. I mean, obviously, you know, we started having students in June. Some schools don't allow that. July, August, and September are certainly the high highest yield times. But applications go out to programs and, and preference signals, which we might talk about uh, in a bit, I'm assuming, I believe on the 29th of September this year. And so on the 29th of September at nine in the morning or six at night, depending on you know what the schedule for that day is, we're already starting to look at, at applications and consider signals. And so those that rotate in October, not to say that they're not going to have a chance, it's just going to be a different kind of a, a different game because the, the interview offers have to go out before that rotation is over. And so I would say for, for most folks, they're probably going to land on somewhere between three and four rotations, uh, depending on the, the requirements and restrictions of their medical school. And I think that's a good number. I think that, you know, I'd be happy to hear uh, Teresa comment on that, but I think it's good for, for programs to have not overdo it so we can have good exposure from those that rotate. And, and that's probably a good number for applicants to um, get a, a reasonable kind of swath of, of different programs without overdoing it. Okay. Okay. Teresa, uh, yeah. How many places did you, so you wrote at University of Washington, your home program, and then one other, two others? Yep. I did. Yep. So I, I did two aways and then my home sub I, and, you know, I met a lot of people on the away, on the away track that they, they'll do four or five away rotations, which I just think is absurd. And the reason why is because they are exhausting. Like sub eyes are exhausting and you are doing them back to back to and I think that you just get super burned out by the end of it. And, you know, you hear this a ways can make or break you in terms of your performance or the letter of rec that you get. And if it's not, you know, a stellar letter of rec and it's just a they did all right letter of rec, then, then that could really hurt you. And so I think that I yeah, so I I, I rotated at my home program, University of Washington, and then I went to uh, UNC in North Carolina or in Chapel Hill. 
And then I went straight to Rochester, Minnesota and did uh, my last at Mayo. And I think that that, like those three were the perfect combination because at the end of it, I was exhausted and could not imagine doing another one. So I think that sure, there's a benefit in doing a lot of a ways in the sense that you can increase your chance of getting in there if you perform well. However, you just have to really take into consideration you know, how difficult those months will be. And you just have to be on and you feel like you're constantly getting evaluated and, and it's it's emotionally and physically exhausting. And so I think that the sweet spot for me at least was three and I would caution anybody in doing more than three or four, really. I appreciate you sh- sharing that. And I'm exhausted just thinking about having to do it in a way. Um, <laughs> confession. And they're expensive. <laughs> confession. So I, I took a year off of uh, between my third and fourth years of medical school and I did a year of research at UT Southwestern, which was transformative. And thank God I left there with a good impression and I didn't do any ways. I was like, there's the thought of like screwing up whatever kind of vibe I've created is off-putting. So uh, I did my home rotation at Tennessee and, you know, did everything on it in God's green earth to make myself as presentable as possible. But I hear that. And, you know, Steve, I think you'd use this analogy on, on the previous episode where you discussed this with Blake, that it's like a four week job interview. And maybe you can just talk a little bit about that. And then also, how do you prepare for this four week job interview to not, it's like anything, right? Like the highs are high, but the lows are lows. And, and I guess the the analogy as for like a job interview is like you can build it up and just knock it out of the park 98% of the time, but one or two medium slip ups can, can kind of leave a different taste in people's mouth. Any thoughts there, Steve? Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I would say, you know, cause I know there's probably, you know, a, a mixture of faculty and students that, that uh, are listening to this. I think that the program should be preparing for this as well. And I mean, as a, as a program director, I don't, experience the same level of exhaustion as the applicants, but we know what they're going through. And we know that this process is one of constant, you know, uh, sense of being measured. And so I think it's incumbent on programs to ensure that students get every bit of mileage out of that, that challenging and difficult four weeks as they can. And so um, this comes down to organizing your uh, education office, to making sure that credentials are, are, are squared away, to make sure that expectations are set, to make sure that schedules are clear, to make sure that the students, uh, you know, know the exposure they'll have with which individual, so they can plan ahead for letters of recommendation. To create an environment that does not foster one of competition between the students. We're a big program, so we'll have several aways uh, away rotators here at any given time, but we've set it up in a way that. They're not constantly tripping over one another, that they're not in the same OR at the same time because no one wants to be in a circumstance as a student where the other student is asked a question and they don't know it, but you do. So do you answer that question and look smarter and yet smug or do you remain reticent and and just allow it to kind of slide? I mean, we want to avoid these circumstances that make things artificially more painful than they need to be. And then I think individual faculty can prepare and it's busy and everyone's always going to have a lot going on clinically, but it doesn't take a lot of extra effort to have your education office tell you who the, the name and, and origin uh, medical school of of the individual to after you spend some time with them take a few short notes in your in your in your smartphone or what have you because over the course of four weeks and busy clinical schedules it's easy to kind of have stuff get kind of lost in the mix especially if you're not going to consider it again for several more months so I think it's incumbent on programs and on faculty that are um, having sub eyes to you know help them maximize the time they have. Um, and so I know that's not really relevant advice to the students, but my hope is, is that there's some faculty that'll be listening to this as well uh, that might be able to benefit also. Yeah, I appreciate that. And that's quintessential UT Southwestern urology education to the max. I mean, I enjoyed it over the course of my time there, both as a resident and faculty where, you know, welcoming students, highly organized, you know, the, I got to say the, the GME staff there, Tisha and company is really pretty second to none, in my opinion. Definitely appreciate you saying that. Yes, like being disorganized, not having things laid out where the residents or excuse me, the visiting students have an expectation of here's when you might be giving a grand rounds talk, here's your schedule, you know, having them show up and kind of teeter around without some direction can be, I'm sure, anxiety provoking as well. And and Teresa, you talked a little bit about, you know, your preparation, anatomy, reading about the cases, listening to back table urology episodes, I'm sure. And uh, things along those lines. 
reflect a little bit on your kind of mentality going into this. Like, how do you, you know, you said you're going to rely on your, as, as a late comer to urology, your clinical presence. You know, what is that, like nitty gritty, what does that mean? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I think that, I'm trying to figure out how to answer this. I think in terms of like, it, just understanding how to manage different hospital systems, different faculty, different protocols. And as part of University of Washington, you know, we rotate across five different states. And so I'm hopping from hospital to hospital in my last two years. So I had a lot of experience coming into new hospitals and, you know, you have to gain trust quickly and you have to form connections and relationships with nursing and and all other all other staff really uh, scrub techs and everybody really you know you it's a consolidated time and so i think that the reason that i was able to perform well clinically was was because i had kind of a general understanding of of how processes work and how i could be helpful and how to stay out of the way and when to ask questions and when not to ask questions and then you know, the the OR is an intimid- intimidating place, but also just understanding that most people in neurology are really cool, awesome people. And, you know, don't be afraid to strike up a conversation with them while they're closing, you know, obviously not during a, a super important part of the case. But it's so easy to say, like, oh, just don't be nervous, but just be a human and like also show them your personality and let that shine through. I think I talk, talked a lot about this on the interview trail, but I think that also like just bringing a positive attitude and an enthusiasm and kind of an eagerness to learn goes goes a long, long way. And so um, I think that, yeah, I mean, people kind of feed off the energy that you give. And I think um, aside from kind of the nitty gritty details that I ha- had spoke about earlier, just, you know, be be yourself and, and be interested, be engaged in, in pretty much every facet of, of your rotation. I think that's great. Steve, let's let's hear from you. Advice to a student who's about to rotate or off doing a ways. I mean, I really uh, related to, you know, Teresa talking about it from her, her uh, initial points, too, of it really being kind of a two-tiered, two-tiered approach. And, and I don't think both of them requires the same degree of preparation. I think without a doubt, when you're going to be in the clinic or certainly going into an OR case, you got to be ready. And it doesn't mean, you know, reading the latest you know, kind of uh, primary literature about it. But like you had said, Aditya, anatomy is is easy to review, it's easy to find, and it never changes. And you're usually going to be asked about it. So, you know, being prepared for the OR, it goes without saying, or it should go out without, say, w- without saying, uh, that you read the H&P, you understand what the plan is, and you know the anatomy. And I think that's a pretty darn good start. And I think that that'll put you in the upper echelon uh, of, of students and, that are interested in urology. I think uh, preparing for for clinic just means uh, looking sharp, showing up on time, being ready to grab a chart. I think it's much better to grab a chart and see a patient being told, hey, don't see that patient, than to just always kind of be on somebody's shadow um, and saying, hey, should I see this person or not? I think being kind of ready and, and motivated is, it speaks a little bit to your, your you know, your kind of your interest and, and motivation to be there with that faculty and to put your best foot forward. And then also remembering that for the other side of it, in terms of your time with the residents, as, as Teresa really, you know, really well eloquently uh, outlined, assessment of fit is a two-way street. And we have a big residency program, and I spend a lot of time talking to the residents about their opinions, about how they felt their fit was with the with, with the sub eyes, and with even during the interview season. And so I think it's important for you to be yourself. And if yourself fits with ourself, which clearly we're trying to put together, then that's, that's, that's the secret sauce. And so I think to be someone other than yourself, to try to look like you fit will be a, a disservice to everyone. But when it, when it works, it works great. And, and, and so I think that's less about preparation and more about, again, being yourself along with the skills that Teresa mentioned, as far as being able to read a room, knowing when to ask questions and, and when to just be there kind of waiting to be told what to do. So that's kind of, again, I think of it in two parts as well. Yeah, I appreciate that. And sometimes I think even some of the, the fundamentals, right, like punctuality, showing up on time. If you're doing a cases and there's images, pull up the images. You don't have to wait for the attending to say, let's look at the CT scan. Like that's something nearly certainly that's never going to be the wrong thing to do. Or, um, you know, for clinic, I mean, I've had some 
rotating students has been mind blowing that they've at least understood in some form or fashion what's going on with every patient of the day and can have a bit of a dialogue and conversation. And it's incredibly impressive. I'm not saying that that's necessary for every person, but you know, it does show commitment, diligence, self-startership. You know, the two kind of things that I'm hearing are authenticity, which I'm a thousand percent sold on, you know, be yourself, make sure the fit's correct. And then, you know, kind of self-initiative to figure out how to make yourself helpful and and also to show your your best face. So I, I appreciate that. I don't think I have much to add, you know, if I was advising a a medical student that, you know, show up, be enthusiastic, be affable, be available, like standard yeah. 101. And, you know, I have a couple more tangible things just because it just feels very close to my heart in terms of if you, you know, if you're getting asked anatomy in the OR and you are, you know, three people behind, you can't really see the surgical field. Like, don't be afraid to just be like, okay, I need to orient myself real quick. And, and I know it's like so easy to panic and be like, shoot, I don't know the answer right away. But like, don't be afraid to take a second to like truly think through the question that they're asking and be like, okay, you know, I'm not exactly sure what they are pointing to is. However, I know this, just like track it back and be like, okay, I know this is the external iliac. This must be the internal iliac. This must, you know, and just like at least talk through your thought process so that they know that you are engaged. And, and if you are disoriented in the case, like ask one of the other residents who may not be actively participating, Hey, can you orient me? Like I'm, I'm super lost right now. And that way you will get so much more out of the procedure than if you just like stay quiet and, and have no idea what you're looking. So that would be one, one tangible. And then going back to the clinic thing, it's super nice to, this is something that I did is you can go through all the attending smart phrases and they all have assessment and plan dot phrases. And so you can go look and like you can learn a lot about each condition or, you know, stage of cancer and learn, like I would do that a ton. And every um, attending, it would be a little bit different, but I would the night before, you know, you can see why the patients are coming, go through and look and then read their dot phrases. And, and sometimes even like I would prepare chart notes at times so that in clinic, I would be a little bit familiar with, with, you know, the patients that were coming. So I think those are some more tangible things that I may not have mentioned the first time. I love it. I love it. That's great. And I mean, you know, these are creative ways to kind of get into, um, you know, the attendings head or thought process, you know, dot BPH or dot urethroplasty. And you're like, okay, I've got a sense of that. Can I hijack and jump on here? Because I'm going to turn what uh, Teresa said into another level of advice for students. And that is kind of prepare actively for letters of recommendation. And I will tell you that the reason that I say this is that, and I hope I don't embarrass Dr. Olmsted by saying this, but part of the reason, uh, I think one thing that shone so, so brightly about your application was one of your letters. And the letter specifically stated what you just shared with us. I won't share the individual that wrote the letter, but it specifically mentioned that you pre-charted on a full clinic of patients that you identified the template, that you pre-wrote notes. And this was something that as a letter reader, so many letters look the same. And so when you see a very specific, tangible example of something that you like to see when people rotate with you, to me that carried you know, about as much weight as had you seen that clinic with me. And so I think that the, the value of the preparation that you mentioned, when that gets into a letter is incredible. And that's my second point is that it, it is helpful for a letter writer to know that they might be your letter writer. And perhaps at a small program or with the chair or perhaps the PD, that's assumed by many of us, and that's probably true. Um, but for larger programs where you're going to be exposed to many faculty, it's much easier and it's sometimes a bit awkward. I understand this for a student, but to, to talk to the person that you may be spending some time with ahead of time and say, I'm really excited to be here. I see that we have a half-day clinic today. I'm going to be with you in the operating room a couple of times. I'm really hoping that I'll have, you'll have enough exposure of my skills to perhaps write, write me a strong letter of recommendation. And I think that that kind of, um, kind of activates the, the attention of that faculty because then as they're working with you, they're already preparing those bullets as they're coming about. And it is much, much better from a letter writer's perspective to be looking at it on the front end as opposed to which happens as well, a week after the rotation, getting an email, thank you for uh, uh, allowing me to rotate there, would you be able to write me a letter? 
we're still happy to write the letters, but the quality of that letter is, is almost invariably going to be better when we're kind of preemptively interacting with you, knowing the letter is going to be there as opposed to after the fact, having to recount those interactions. That being said, when that does happen, one thing that I do like, I mean, it's standard to send your letter writer, uh, you know, perhaps a reminder of your CV, your personal statement. I also like when I get a paragraph or two of saying, Dr. Hudek, uh, thank you for being willing to write my letter. As a summary, we spent three days together in clinic. We did X, Y, Z. The cases we did were, were A, B, C. That's helpful too, not only to, you know, kind of refresh my memory as the writer, but also to indicate that you found those experiences as valuable as well and remind me of perhaps uh, some, some skills that, 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 that you put forward as a student. And so, again, I think, uh, Teresa, again, you're an excellent example of, uh, of that. Um, but I think that I'm trying to leverage that into some kind of tangible kind of uh, skills or uh, suggestions for students as they're going to be going through this in the coming months. That's great. That's great. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, these days, sometimes I have to request letters of recommendation from a chairperson or something or the other for some application. And I, I will many times just write it because I don't, ex you know, for the letters that I'm referencing, usually they're not quite as critical as ones for a residency application, but it does make it easier if it's like, hey, Manoj, or hey, Klaus, here's like a little template, do what you will. I don't think that's what you're suggesting exactly, but it is some detail to kind of help highlight uh, highlight the applicant. Yeah, an example was one that I received a couple of years ago is Dr. Hudak, you know, thank you for being willing to write a letter. You may recall we spent a half day clinic at Parkland. We saw a patient that was, was uh, Spanish speaking only, and it gave me an opportunity to show my clinical skills along with my language skills. And that immediately when I read that, brought it right back into my mind. It brought me back into that clinic room when I was indeed impressed by that student's ability to do a difficult and sensitive genital exam on a person of a different gender with a person that speaks a different language using her uh, uh, English or sorry, her, her Spanish skills. So again, little clues like that could really help augment the letter because you're darn right that made it into the letter that I wrote. Perfect. Perfect. Teresa, did you have anything to comment in, in terms of letters? No, I thank you for saying that, Dr. Hudak. I had no idea, so I appreciate you saying that. I think that I I should have probably been more strategic in terms of who I was asking to get letters. For me, I did not plan that ahead of time. It was more so like, you know, you know when you have a good day with somebody and and at this program, they would sit and kind of give you feedback at the end of each day. And so I kind of took that opportunity to ask for a letter, but I do think that, you know, being more proactive in that. If you if you do have somebody in particular that you are trying to get a letter from, which that's a whole nother discussion, do it early on. Do it early on. Or if you do do it after the fact, ask early. Don't ask eight, two weeks later because odds are they're going to forget everything. That they've got a lot of students coming into play. That's right. That's right. And so there's obviously the clinic, there's the OR, there's the letters, and then many times there's a presentation in some form or fashion. And mm -hmm. if I could prepare, prepare early, float the idea by several people, make sure that there's not somebody scheduled to do the same talk the same day, practice it until you're blue in the face, practice it in front of a colleague who can advise you on it. If you have a faculty mentor, run it through them so it can be tip top ship shape. And obviously you should know more about that topic than anybody in the room would be kind of my advice. Steve, Teresa, anything to lop on top of that? Yeah, I definitely agree. And I think, you know, asking the residents, uh, um, you know, that are at the place where you're rotating to take a quick look at it uh, with plenty of time in advance. If you send it to them uh, slides only the night before, that's probably asking a little bit much. But, you know, people are generally interested in, you know, helping helping you get a second look at things, um, making sure that slides are, you know, well formatted. And then, um, you know, you mentioned being the expert in the room on it. I think choosing your topic strategically, you know, if I was going to go to UCSD and my topic would be testicular cancer. That would be hard to kind of keep the audience kind of interested knowing the amount of uh, info that they have on it locally, but maybe some subtlety about it that very few in the room might know, I, I think is a more strategic way to think about it because then at least you'll be educating the majority of the room. Uh, so I think, that that's, I think that that's an important thing that I like to see is kind of give yourself a break by choosing something that's on the, on the center of everyone's interest, but on the fringes of their knowledge. Fantastic. Fantastic. So We've done our aways. You've done them maybe ideally July, August aways, maybe a home rotation in June. Maybe if you've got some concerns, you've tagged on another one for October. So signals, just 
a little bit about that. This is new from when I was a applying resident, as are many things, but signals. Walk through that process, maybe Teresa. Yeah, signals. So the, I think this was fairly new, um, but essentially my year, we were given five signals and you hear a lot of different advice in terms of how to divvy out those signals. Some people will say, send it to your five reach programs the top five reach programs. Some people will say, send it to what you believe to be your one through five in terms of your rank list. And then some will say, do not send it to any prestigious program that you think is going to get a lot of program or a lot of signals because it essentially, they won't, they, they're going to get so many that it won't be taken into consideration. I very much went, I went um, the avenue of sending it to what I believed were going to be my top five programs in terms of my rank list. Um, I think I got four, I got interviews at four out of my five programs that I signaled. And yeah, I don't know. You guys probably have more insight from a program's perspective. For us, it was just like, it was, you know, you just hear so much, you read so much about what the heck these, these signals are good for. And to this day, I don't really know if the signal had anything to do with the interviews I got, but, but that's how I chose to go about my signals. So it's it's interesting because um, it it's almost new every year, every other year. Um, uh, it was new two years ago, and it's going to be or it is changing again for this year. I think some mm-hmm. of the concern with the five signals was, um, I think the the numbers within um, from the SAU were that twenty five percent of the programs got fifty percent of all signals. So there was a, a bias because there were so few signals, and it probably speaks to what Teresa was saying about you know people kind of using it more to show interest to reach programs, uh, if you will. And so this year it's going to, it's going to change again. It will be 30 unweighted signals and, uh, also different from last year. The recommendation, uh, is to use, uh, those signals also for your home program and places where you rotated. So this is very, very different. It's not new overall. Uh, this was done by orthopedics, I believe, uh, for the first time last year. So there is data available from this, uh, orthopedics is not identical to urology. Um, I think it's about 2x in scale and in, in, in terms of the size, but does have a lot of similarities with regards to being a surgical sub and its level of competitiveness. And, uh, and, and, the, and the data that's available on this is interesting where um, since you have more signals, it's almost viewed as a, as a de facto application cap. The goal of, by the SAU was to, to limit the number of, of try to, to get a hold of this kind of uh, application overload um, but there was concerns that there might be litigation with regards to uh, labor laws and whatnot if they actually limited people. And so what other programs have done is uh, kind of given a large number of signals to then say, well, if there's so many signals out there, um, the likelihood of getting an interview at a place that you did not signal would be low. And indeed, in orthopedics, that was the case. I think the numbers were for places that applica- applicants signaled, if they, if they signaled that program, they had a 25% chance of getting an interview offer. If they did not, they had a less than 1% chance. It's nice to, you know, having kind of seen orthopedics be the guinea pig on this, that to give us some headway into it. And hopefully it'll be easier on students as well, because I think most people would be able to realistically assemble a list of 30 places they'd be interested to go without having to stratify by the, what they thought was, was a reach or a sure bet or, or what have you. Fascinating. And um, a lot, a lot of kind of thoughts, but it sounds like basically it's like, you can apply to as many places as you want to, but you probably don't need to more than 30. So I think it accomplishes the goal because I feel like the statistics for the number of programs people are applying to is just astronomical. And I guess some of the uh, cost considerations of traveling, et cetera, are gone. My understanding is that virtual interviews are here for the moment. Is that correct? Yeah. So SAU has uh, you know, decided that they would be, again, um, everything will be a virtual only. And wait, there's more. Uh, I actually just read this today that uh, through the ERAS system, uh, whereas I think in the past that there was an opt-out for this, now there's no longer an opt-out for specialties. So there will be a a geographic regional preference as well as um, a rural versus urban preference, as well as a hometown listed preference. And um, so I think that of the six regions, you can choose to um, list three regions, and I think they kind of uh, mimic the the uh, uh, AUA sections. Or you can list that you have no preference, and then programs will see that. And so, I mean, I think the theme here is that we're trying to 
allow students to reveal their actual preferences because clearly just sending an application to you know didn't doesn't do that anymore in the previous era so there's a lot of tools at the at the at the at the disposal of of applicants and then programs hopefully will allow us to really kind of hone in on uh, you know a fewer number of applications to really review those in much much more detail which each applicant definitely deserves okay well um I mean, I guess we're going to find out how this plays out, and I'm sure there's some kind of feedback that's going to be built in for applicants and programs once this is rolled out for a uh, a time or two. But um, it does sound like it would help out with the tremendous number of applications. So, and I know we're we're kind of getting there, but um, advice to a person, let's say it's 30 applicants. I was basically told, you know, 30% reaches, 30% solid kind of within your within your capacity based on metrics from once upon a time and 10% that might be, you know, a, a little bit more of a likely possibility. I don't really know that I believe any of that anymore. I think it evolved a lot in that there's no best program, there's better fits, but overall it's an embarrassment of riches. Teresa, how did you go about it? Steve, how would you advise somebody? How did I go about doing my signals or applying to places? like uh, picking more, choosing, more, Yeah, picking, picking and choosing. And choosing applications. Yeah. Uh, When I first did my first pass, I think I had 30 programs in which I was like, I would be excited to be here. And it was very much based off regionality or, you know, program prestige. And then I looked at it after clicking down the whole list and I was like, shoot, this is only 30. And nobody applies to only 30 programs, at least not in the last couple of years. And so then I had to go back and, and, and choose several more. But I think that I did not take into consideration reach programs or, you know, safety net programs whatsoever. I think that I just went based off what I knew about the programs and and um, the location in which they were in. And there were certain things that I wanted in a program. And there was a handful of programs that, that uh, matched that. And then I just kind of had to pick and choose enough to get to, I think I ended up applying to like 57 or 58 programs. And but yeah, there was really only 30 of those that I would I was like, oh yeah, I would be excited to go here. And so then I just had to handpick because we were told to to apply to more than 30 programs. Yeah, I think that's a mature, normal way to look at it versus this super terrifying, paranoid, cast the whitest net possible. Steve, what do you think? Yeah, and it's almost it's it's somewhat ironic that 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 Teresa kind of said, hey, 30 is where I kind of that's that's where I felt you know, right in terms of places that I wanted to be, but yet I felt the pressure as many do, and and it's totally expected. And I'm sure I would have done the same uh, in this era okay. to to over you know kind of go above and beyond because that's what the trend and what your mentors and everyone's telling you to do. But I think the fact of the matter was you were able to identify 30 programs that you could see yourself training as, and that that's the advice uh, again based on limited data from orthopedics and just what I've learned about this process uh, and what we've experienced with other models is to, without a doubt, choose those 30 programs that you could see yourself training at, uh, uh, that you see yourself as potentially being a good fit, and whether that's based on metrics that are available, talking to mentors, or strictly geography, which geography means a lot. So I think that kind of just you know going for what you think you're interested in and not trying to game it in some way or another, because the data would say that if there's no sure bets if you don't give a signal by this model. And so I would say, don't leave places off that list that you want to go to and include only places uh, that that you could see yourself training at. Yeah. And it's interesting. You know, I think that this 30 signal um, cap is going to benefit the programs a lot. But I think that this process is so anxiety provoking from an applicant's viewpoint that I guarantee you they're going to probably apply to just as many programs. But I think that it will be more attainable for programs to weep through these applications because they're there, they at least have uh, they have something to to signal more interest than than just you know applying a wide uh, cast, casting about that. I don't know if I totally agree with that, Teresa. I think with all the signals, applicants or programs, we get tons of applicants, and I can tell you here, I know it in Dallas. You know the work required, especially as we've I think appropriately shifted away from you know, benchmarks or quotas like board scores, it's crazy hard. I mean, you're sifting through 300 applications trying to figure out who the 30 to 40 to 50 people you are. And, you know, to stay committed and hang in there through that process is, I think, challenging. So Uh 
Do you think that you guys will look at it? This, I'm just purely curious now. Do you think that you will look at applicants that do not, sig- you know, that do not signal the program? No, it's a fair question. I think it will depend entirely on how many signals that program gets, right? So okay. if, if you okay. get um, with this many signals, and again, this is kind of leaning in on, on, you know, my knowledge of the process as well as what happened in orthopedics. If your program is one of the programs that gets 250 signals, it, it, it would be really hard to say that you'd look beyond those 250 applications when those are 250 applicants that, you know, ranked you and they're, you know, kind of viewed you as one of their top 30. But if you're a program that gets 50 signals, it'll probably be a lot different. And that's going to be impossible to predict. Sure. I'll tell you from the orthopedics yeah. literature, I think, again, this was survey data, so it, it's, it's certainly imperfect. But the data that they had, about half of programs, 100% of the, of the interviews that they sent out had signaled. So half of the programs, they only interviewed those that signaled. And overall, 75% of the, of the interviews that were offered by each program were from signals. So it certainly tilts in a direction um, that it won't, I mean, nothing in the world is going to kind of alleviate the stress and the, and the anxiety that's provoked by students going through this. But I think everyone's hoping that it'll, it'll, it'll hopefully dial that number back from 70 or 80, which I think was the average, you know, closer to 30. Now, does that mean that you're a, a fool for applying to 40? Not at all. But I think the, the goal is for, for everyone for it to decrease the anxiety, to uh, decrease the cost, and to improve the quality of the review process, which without a doubt will be, we have four weeks to review applications. And there's, if we want to devote a lot of time to a lot of applications, we need a lot of help at our departments. And the, but it's just a numbers game because there's a finite uh, number of time or amount of time that we have. And so the better that you can hone that down in a fair way, as I believe this is, the better look we'll be able to give to each of those applications of people that are honestly interested in a program, which I think serves everybody on both sides of the fence. For sure. That makes sense. It'll be interesting it, to see. It will. I'm it, sure there'll be data published after yeah, this. I'm yeah. sure there will be. And, and hopefully then it'll yeah. be some stability and it won't change again in a couple of years. But I do, yeah. you know, tip my hat. Yeah. I'm not involved in the SAU, but I do tip my hat to them of really trying year after year to come up with something that bo- that really kind of supports both parties, the applicants and the programs uh, in a way that's that, that, that that's that's fair to everyone. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes when I reflect, on the one hand, I think it's really nice that applicants get, are encouraged to be their selves and be their authentic selves, which is certainly a step in the right direction. On the other side, for a variety of reasons, I think the popularity of the field, the less algorithmic approach to making yourself a marketable candidate can be anxiety-provoking. And it absolutely seems like, and this is, I think, a good thing, that that programs have their kind of cultures, fits, norms. So it's... uh. I think it's there, you know, there's really pros and cons of the way things have evolved. But I do think in general, the idea is to make this a little less anxiety provoking, facilitate best fit versus this is what an ideal candidate looks like for any given program. All right. So, so we've applied, we've got application, we've got interviews in. I mean, I think, you know, again, like to me, it's like 101, make sure that you're punctual, you're on time make sure your camera is like reasonable and that you're not like backlit like a shadow or something ridiculous like that, which, which does happen periodically. And then, you know, be yourself. Teresa, I think your point about taking a breath and thinking for like a millisecond before you start word vomiting, whatever comes into your head is prudent and not easy to do, especially kind of an anxiety provoking setting. But there's, you know, think about questions to ask for the program because that always comes up. You know, if you have a minute to read a little bit about what the faculty's up to, never a bad thing. Have your elevator spiel that doesn't sound like an elevator spiel. <laughs> <laughs> you know, th- these are some of those things that pop into my head. What what did what are the, some of the things that you did to prepare, Teresa? I think the best advice for me was like a lot of the questions are situational, you know, and so I came up with five clinical situations that I could pretty much uh, apply to any question that would, would, you know, would uh, be asked of me. And so whether that's, you know, you're always going to be asked about a conflict. So have something that you can talk about in terms of the last four years, you know, whether that was in clinic or with, it doesn't even have to be medically related, you know, and that's, I think uh, another big thing is there's this pressure of, oh gosh, I don't necessarily have this big conflict in a medical setting. It can be outside of medicine. It just like, what they're looking for is how you reflect on it. And, and 
So yeah, I very much had like five different um, anecdotes and then uh, just elaborated on kind of like how I how I learned from that and what I gained from it and how, you know, what I would do in the future to prevent that from happening. And so, yeah, I think like my, I would say maybe five to seven little anecdotes could answer just about any question that was asked of me. And then, of course, just, I mean, I remember my first interview, my voice was like trembling and I don't generally get nervous <laughs> for interviews, but I was sweat. It was, it was, once you get the first one under your belt, it, it gets easier. But just know it's so normal to just be absolutely terrified of your first interview. But eventually you'll settle out and kind of get into the role of things and, yeah, swing of things. I should. You know, and, and I appreciate you sharing that. To me, it would be very touching and nostalgic if, for instance, the first interview of the interview season, the person was just like, oh, my God, I can't believe this is happening. I'm, you know, this is like <laughs> surreal. Just be like, yeah, I remember that. And, you know, that's to me like a part of the authenticity. Like it doesn't need to be like, you know, you're all freaked out and paranoid and it's like scripted. Fantastic. And and Steve, what do you think? You know, what are some of the advice that you give to applying students? Well, I mean, I think reminding a uh, reminder that, you know, we're nervous too. I mean, obviously in a very different way, um, but from a program perspective, we want to put our best foot forward. We want to really uh, make use of the time. Time is such a, a, such a valuable commodity in these settings. So we want to give you the opportunities to tell your story and, and do that in a short amount of time so we can actually listen to that. That certainly won't take away nervousness, but remember it is a two-way street and we want to get everything perfect too. And we get flubbed up and frustrated if there's a technical glitch. We never get upset at you. We just get disappointed with our own, uh, our own systems when things don't work perfectly. And so, you know, just remember that, albeit in a different way, that it's, that it's uh, you know, everyone's really excited. Everyone's really amped up. Uh, we view the times as really, really important. Um, I would say the other piece of advice I would have is you know, really, you know, like, like Teresa, you know, said, kind of have, have things kind of prepped and ready to go. And I really like to hear uh, something that's been important for me uh, in this process is really hearing examples of this demonstration of resiliency and grit. Surgery is very difficult. And thinking back, I don't know if I didn't have things that helped me develop grit uh, and resiliency before training. I, I, I wouldn't have made it through residency and I certainly wouldn't have made it, wouldn't have made it through the first five years of practice after, after training. And so, I love to hear stories and there's so different, so many different stories, whether it's, you know, a personal tragedy or someone that's an athlete uh, who is in the performing arts, just kind of, you know, in, you know individual stories about, about um, how candidates can kind of demonstrate that they have the ability to navigate through uh, and thrive in circumstances that are very, very challenging and, and very um, uh, demanding on us. And so those would be the two pieces of uh, kind of advice I have going into the interview process. Yeah, I appreciate that. And, you know, I feel very fortunate for a variety of reasons. People reach out for some mentorship and advice, both within our institution and outside. And, you know, our, our field and the the makeup of the urology workforce is changing, in my mind, for the better, more diverse, more represented. That doesn't mean that there's not people that are historically overrepresented that may be just a perfectly wonderful urologist and if I come across such a person, I always tell them, you know, you've got your story, you know, figure out what's ultra unique about, about you because a thousand percent that exists and, you know, our own experiences are so individual and they're not relational. There's no like scale of, you know, if X happened to you or Y happened to you or Z happened to you. I think as long as it's something that people can relate to and, and they've kind of been through it, or they can see how that would be impactful, you know, reflect on it, you know, reflect on that process and how it changed you and try to be again, introspective and authentic about it. Cause I think that that comes across. And the other thing I would just say is, you know, both for, uh, the interviewee and the interviewer, it's really an amazing time to like, get to know somebody for like 15 minutes. And I mean, there's still people that I keep in touch with that have, you know, said, Hey, that yeah, remember you from interviews. And we've been kind of following your career and rooting for you or certainly people that I've interviewed with, I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I met this like larger than life person. What a wonderful thing. So uh, recognizing that it's like ultra anxiety provoking to try to enjoy the experience a bit as well would be, you know, something I offer. Without a doubt, I'll just just say quick that, I, you know, I can connect with that. And again, it's, it's a two-way street. And, and so, 
you, you go through the process as, as, a, as a faculty and as a program and you connect with people and, and some you train and, and some you don't. Some you get a chance to do a podcast with and, and, and get, to, get to see her, uh, you know, uh, having matched at a great program. And so I think that it's, it's really exciting to kind of, despite it being virtual, um, still having the ability to connect with people and then reconnect with people down the road. I think that, that you know, we're learning how to do that virtually. And so um, uh, it's, it's definitely a, you know, a special time for everybody. Yeah, I mean, I'll take a walk down memory lane myself. I mean, there when I was a young faculty still at UT Southwestern, there was a resident that did in a way, and you know, fast forward six years, we're working on some research projects together, and uh, you know, it's just so cool. And I think there's two things. One is your impression whether you match up at a spot or not is going to last. So make sure you're not telling six places that you're going to rank them number one. That's there's probably very little benefit to come of that. And then two, most people, regardless of where you go, as long as they're like a reasonable, decent person, are probably hoping for you to have a lights out career and, you know, find find your people. I had one other thought or advice for interviews, and it's like try to be as concise as possible. And I'm, you know, from me, I ramble way too much and I've even rambled on this podcast way too much. But try to um, try to come up with your answers in a concise manner because you only have very little time with each with each faculty or resident that you're interviewing with and so if you're rambling the whole time you can't really get your point across and and if you do find yourself rambling I can't tell you how many times on the interview track I was like I am rambling did I even answer the question that was asked and and just like kind of bring your center yourself and be like okay what was the question and then and then restart and try to do it in a concise manner fantastic well, hey guys, I've definitely, you could continue to chat and take a walk down memory lane, but uh, maybe as we, gosh, come across an hour and some change here, any parting thoughts, uh, maybe start with you, Steve, and then we'll get some from Teresa as well. Yeah, I would just say that it's a competitive specialty for a reason, and that's because it's a, it's a spectacular field that has, you know, wonderful, uh, both breadth and depth, but don't view that competitiveness as, as, as a negative view it as, as, as a positive because it's something that people want to do. It's a specialty that's very much needed. And again, with the, the current structure of the way the application process works, I think the playing field has been leveled. And so just, you know, use your abilities to amplify what's unique and special about you along the process. And I think that that really will allow you to tell your story of how you're different and how you're ready and how you're capable. And good luck. That sounds great. That sounds great. Teresa. Yeah, I would totally echo that. And then just, I would say, lean on the people that you have around you. And and it's hard uh, for people who may not have home programs, but if you can connect with a, a you know a local urologist, or for me, it was like the residents at UW were hugely helpful for me, and um, or people who have graduated. And I'm always happy to answer questions or, or lend advice because I remember how stressful the process is. And you know, there is an end in sight, but just know everybody is probably feeling the way that, that these applicants are right now. And like, don't ever hesitate to reach out because there's a ton of people, especially in the urology community, who want to help and support you along the way. I love it. I love it. Well, um, Teresa, Steve, thanks again for sharing your insights and your experience. Um, it's been a, it's been a real pleasure. Absolutely enjoyed it. And, you know, in T minus about uh, eight weeks, I guess we'll jump on into it. So we'll make sure we get this out there for all our uh, <laughs> rotating students and applicants. Best of luck. Thank you. Thanks Thank a lot. You. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, DM us at underscore Backtable on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable is hosted by Aditya Bagrodia and Jose Silva. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, and Ness smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz with support from Devante Delbrun. Social media and PR by G. Dang. Administrative support provided by Jimmy Lee Kennebrew. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.